Happy birthday, dear Aaron. Happy birthday. <laughs> Aaron Copeland is 80 years old. Greetings pour in from dignitaries, artists, school children, and from his colleagues in the music world. In Washington, D.C., a press corps normally occupied with visiting heads of state turns its attention to a composer of music for the concert and theater stages. I suppose um, the thing that I'm, uh, I feel luckiest about is the fact that I was able to spend my life at music, in music, with music. Not everybody is, is so lucky. When I told my father I wanted to be a composer of concert music, he said, where did you get such a strange idea? <laughs> <laughs> but he paid for the lessons. I think basically you compose uh, because you want to um, somehow summarize in some permanent form your most basic feelings about being alive. Uh, life seems so transitory that it seems very attractive to be able to set down in either words or tones or paint or some way some sort of permanent statement about the way it feels to live now, today, so that when it's, when it's all gone, people will be able to go to the artwork of the time and get some sense of what it felt like to be alive. Okay, that's us. <laughs> He's definitely more sorry. Washington, D.C., WQED Pittsburgh. In association with the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Presents the first in a series of special events. Tonight, Aaron Copeland, Leonard Bernstein, Mstislav Rostropovich, and the National Symphony Orchestra with piano soloist Leo Smith in A Copeland Celebration. This evening's host is Hal Holbrook. Good evening. Welcome to Kennedy Center and the first of our special programs fine offerings from the worlds of dance, music, and drama, all performed in this, our National Cultural Center. On November 14, 1980, an event occurred here which did honor even to so honored a place as Kennedy Center. In a celebration here in the concert hall, Aaron Copeland, our nation's foremost composer, turned 80 years old. Since he began, Aaron Copeland has been something of an exception in the world of music. The son of immigrant parents, he was born and raised in Brooklyn. He studied in Paris. With this background, he returned to the United States in 1924 and resolved to put the sounds around him into his music, the sounds of the cities and the sounds of the countryside. 
quite an ambition for a young man whose ears rang with Brooklyn peddlers and Parisian conservatories. But that's what Copeland wanted to do. And for reasons even he can't fully explain, and with this unlikely background, Aaron Copeland has been the most successful composer at getting Americans to hear America in American music. Tonight, we'll hear his fanfare for the common man, his piano concerto, the movie music, Appalachian Spring, and the Lincoln portrait narrated by Mr. Copeland himself. All of them have become American favorites. In his music is our country, devoid of politics, without sectionalism, just the ideal, standing proud and bold before the world. And that is why Leonard Bernstein, the National Symphony Orchestra, and its music director, Mstislav Rostropovich, and the President of the United States paid tribute on that November evening to our foremost American composer, from Kennedy Center tonight, a Copeland celebration. this con congratulatory letter to our beloved Aaron Copeland from our beloved President Jimmy Carter. The White House, Washington, November 13th, 1980, to Aaron Copeland. I am delighted to join with the National Symphony with scores of your colleagues and with your innumerable admirers in paying joyous tribute to you in celebration of your 80th birthday. Wherever music is played and loved, at home and abroad, among your fellow composers, among musicians, and among ordinary listeners, you are justly recognized as America's foremost composer. As an author, teacher, lecturer, pianist, conductor and organizer of concerts for the promotion of contemporary music, especially by American composers, you have made unique contributions to American culture. But above all, it is for the beauty of the music you have given us that we praise, admire, and love you. We are proud to join in this fanfare for a most uncommon man. Sincerely, Jimmy Carter.
The fanfare for the common man was one of 18 fanfares commissioned from 18 different composers, but only Copeland's found its place as an American favorite. Of course, this doesn't mean that everything he wrote was instantly accepted. <laughs> Not at all. In fact, uh, we're about to hear the second movement of his piano concerto, written in 1924, and absolutely murdered by the critics. Jazz was spreading around the country. Well, Copeland heard it as an American sound, and true to his beliefs, he put it into his music. Jazz in a piano concerto. Almost to a man, the critics took him apart. A jazz dance hall next to a poultry yard, one of them said. But Copeland wasn't interested in overnight success. He had the courage of his convictions. And his convictions were that this was our music for our ears, and it belonged in our concert halls. Seeing this gentle-looking, vulnerable man in rehearsal with the National Symphony and pianist Leo Smith, it's hard to imagine him weathering the onslaught of the press and the public. Do we do that but he did. From the 14, for the sake of that, uh, poco a poco charando, stay with the stick, please. 14. Yeah, that's uh, that's slower. Yatta ta 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 ta. The charando is in the second half of the measure. 14. I don't remember the exact nature of the uh, reviews of the piano concerto when first played in 1927 in Boston with the Boston Symphony. I was the solo pianist, but I remember there was an air of shock about them all. Watch the three-quarter measure, don't let it throw you. 25. It caused a bit of an excitement in Boston because I made use of jazz elements. And in the 20s, you know, jazz was thought to be, well, okay in its place. But the attitude was, for heaven's sakes, what is it doing in Symphony Hall, Boston, as if we were playing jazz in church, you see? So that it was a shocker at the time. And I was highly amused and pleased. I keep hearing that performance in 1927 with the Boston Symphony. Uh, three measures before 46. Kuzmitsky had never had any contact with jazz of any kind up to that point. It was a little strange. Three before 46. <laughs> I would have started uh, conducting much sooner than I did, but my great friend Kuzmitsky used to shake his finger at me and say, you must not waste your time conducting. You must compose. And of course, I took him very seriously. And um, I didn't do it. I didn't try to do any conducting. But as soon as he died, I began. It was really a suppressed passion. Sorry, I, I think the trombone was in just a little too soon. Yes. Uh, at 20, please. 20. Mm. It is a great joy to um, have a really fine orchestra at your command, so to speak, and to conduct your own music in a way that you dreamt it. I mean, it might not be as good as somebody else's interpretation, but nevertheless, it's the way you thought of it, uh, or you get as close as you can to the way you thought of it in an actual performance, and that, that as I say, is a great pleasure. <laughs>
the second and final movement of Aaron Copland's Concerto for Piano and Orchestra. The composer conducted the National Symphony Orchestra with pianist Leo Smith. Just a few years after the first performance of the concerto with all of the brouhaha about poultry yards, it became another concert favorite. Copeland had done it again. Like a parent leading a family of stubborn children, he forced us to listen, and sure enough, we started to like what we heard. As far as Copeland was concerned, this was the sound of America. If we'd only be quiet and listen for a minute, we'd hear it too. Aaron Copeland didn't invent an American sound, of course not. He helped develop an American ear to hear it with. He used what he heard going on around him, sometimes with astonishing results. In 1944, he wrote music for a ballet choreographed by his good friend Martha Graham. Graham was doing an American dance in theater what Copeland was doing in music. By this time, she'd so enlarged the vocabulary of expressive dance movement that she, she created her own style and her own school to teach it in. Well, that was an immortal collaboration. From it issued two great works of the American stage. Graham's most famous choreography, some of which we'll see in this rare film which features her dancing, and Copeland's most beloved music. Both were eloquent expressions of the strength, piety, and simple traditions of our country's roots. Copeland used an old Shaker hymn called Simple Gifts for part of the score. Subtitled Ballet for Martha, this was the genesis of Appalachian Spring. Well, I knew Miss Graham not only as a performer as a, and a choreographer, but also I knew her personally. And she has a very striking personality. You don't forget her. Uh, very personal to herself, of course. And uh, when she asked me to um, write this ballet, it had no title. She gave me an outline of what was going to happen in it, and of course the nature of the, the, the uh, dances, uh, the characters that they were going to portray. But it, uh, as I say, it, it had no uh, specific title. So that when I, many times people have said to me, when they hear the music uh, and see the ballet, they can just see the, the Appalachians and feel spring. But the fact of the matter is that when I wrote the music, I didn't know uh, anything about the Appalachians. I wasn't thinking about either spring or the Appalachians. I was thinking about Martha Graham and her style of dancing. I think most people who watch her ballets are, are very aware of the fact that it's very personal to her, the style of dancing that you see on the stage, and the nature of the ballets that uh, she produces with her dances. So that it was comparatively easy to write a score for her because her style and her personality is so marked. In a way, I was not thinking about the Appalachians of Spring, I was thinking about Martha and putting her and her uh, style of dancing to music.
Diego. Not necessarily going too far, not Copeland wrote much of Appalachian Spring in, of all places, the Sam Goldwyn Studios in Hollywood. The reason was simple enough. He was composing for the movies. You see, beginning in 1939, Hollywood discovered Aaron Copeland. And true to form, even with composers, they typecast him. It didn't matter to them that he was one of the world's foremost classical composers. No, to Hollywood, Aaron Copeland was Americana through and through. I had an interesting experience with uh, the music I wrote for the heiress. There's a scene in, wh in which the heiress girl decides to elope against the wishes of her parents with her young man. And they decide at 11 o'clock at night, he knows a minister who will come and marry them, and he'll go and get them. This is around 1905 on Washington Square in New York. And he'll come, and he'll, he'll marry them there and then. And so off the young man goes to get the minister, and she's waiting. Now, that's a great scene from um, music because nobody's saying anything. And yet, you can't have it silent, so the composer has a real chance to get his innings in. She's waiting for the carriage to come. Each time she hears the carriage come, she rushes out to the stoop of the house and thinks that's him. And it always turns out, no, it isn't him. It happens three or four times. And nobody's saying anything. So I wrote a very uh, romantic sort of music. She's waiting and he's coming and this kind of da 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 and so forth. And uh, finally, at the climax of the scene, you see the final carriage goes by. She, she decides he's not coming. She's, she's being jilted. She goes back very dejected into the house. And we took the picture out as they do to one little movie house that didn't know it was going to see a tryout of a film. And when that scene was played, and she turned away, the audience laughed. Well, that was murder. <laughs> the director came to me and said, Copeland, this is impossible. If they laugh at her, then we don't have a story. They won't take her seriously. They don't care about her. 
you've got to do something to save this scene. Well, I, you've got to stop them from laughing. I said, well, how can I stop them from laughing? If they want to? He said, do anything you like, but stop them from laughing. Then I went back and I thought, this is a rather interesting problem. Maybe I can stop them from laughing. So I threw out the music I had written and wrote a completely different sort of music, very uh, hectic and dissonant, more dissonant than you're used to hearing in a film theater, certainly. Sort of modern music style, hectic. There he is. <laughs> Goodbye, Aunt. I will write to you, Aunt. <laughs> They took it out to another little theater without warning. They played the same scene, and there wasn't a sound in the house. The audience probably wasn't, didn't know music was going on, but it created a tense and uh, taut kind of feeling around. I felt it myself when I heard the thing, which uh, prevented them from thinking of it as funny. That was a, a very good illustration to me, how the power of music in the film theater to kind of control emotions of an audience even against when they don't know their emotions are being played with. His score for the heiress won the Academy Award in 1950. Not bad for a classical modernist. With his music for the movies, Aaron Copeland reached a wider audience than ever before. Now he was respected, but performed as well. Not an easy combination to achieve for a modern composer. He'd become a popular spokesman for modern music, too. In his writings, he spoke simply and directly in terms everyone could understand. Perhaps his most special commission came from the late Andre Kostelanitz, one of America's favorite conductors. It was December of 1941. The war had just hit America. Kostelanitz called for a gallery of three musical portraits from three composers embodying the qualities of courage, dignity, strength, simplicity, and humor, which are so characteristic of the American people. Copeland chose Abraham Lincoln as his subject. The result was the Lincoln portrait. So uncommonly popular did this piece become that it was issued by two record companies almost simultaneously. This is what Copeland wrote about the music of another great composer, Ludwig von Beethoven. In Copland's words, Beethoven told us to be noble, be strong, be great in heart, yes, and be compassionate. Think of those words as we watch first a bit of rehearsal and then performance of the Lincoln portrait narrated by the composer himself and conducted by his friend of 40 years, Leonard Bernstein. Tired. They're playing very well. You trained them good. Let's <laughs> yes. do 41 because of that funny change of the bassoon, the 4 2 bar. That's it. Excuse me. Clarinet, we should hear re, la, re, the end of the theme. Don't disappear. You're, you're only piano. You're not piano. Either. You've got the tune, right? And ever since the second phrase, it's one piano, not two. All right. The same thing, please, 41. Right. 
And Leonard Bernstein was 18 years old, and he looked me up, and he played the piano variations for me, and I was very impressed indeed, not only by the performance of the variations, but the uh, mentality of this young fellow, the liveliness, the music, obvious musical gift that he had, the whole thing yeah. added up to quite a, you know, quite an event. Um, and then um, I saw him on gradually more and more on different occasions, and uh, then Tanglewood was organized, of course, and he came as a student in the beginning, conducting student. I really can't see a great deal of difference between the Lenny of 18 years old and the Lenny of today. He was a, a formed character in a, an amazing sense. Uh, where he learned it from, I cannot imagine. He, I know his father, his mother, his sister, and his brother. There was no sign in the world, no reason in the world why that family should have produced a Lenny Bernstein. But there it was. <laughs> I had an image of Aaron as a kind of great patriarch with a beard, looking something like Walt Whitman, and of a certain age and fiery, declamatory, Old Testament type prophet, because that's all in the music. Lincoln was a quiet man. Abe Lincoln was a quiet and a melancholy man. But when he spoke of democracy, this is what he said. He said, as I would not be a slave, that, Lenny, could that be a, could that be a little quiet? I just sort of get in the way. Sorry, that's... Could you hear him all right? Yeah. That's the point. You see, you, you don't have to right? out on stage. But yeah. it's them we're interested in. Okay. And we're playing on the mezzo piano. Okay. Yeah, we right? can hear you. Good. Can, can you give more on same to radical principle? I mean, without booming and without you know, getting feedback? He, he could, yeah, I mean, can, can he give he could, more? Maybe. He could give as much as he wants, it'll be all fine. It is the same tyrannical principle. I mean, he shouts. It's all right, right? Yeah, that's fine. Won't boom. I'm okay. not a shouter. I know. <laughs> um, okay. Where are we, Lenny? We are just around where you said it was too loud, and it isn't. Two thirty. Where? Two thirty. Shall we fire the conductor? <laughs> Two thirty. I'd like to do the cello plays again. Two twenty-six. Two twenty. This is just for the quiet guy. Yeah. He is also the most moderate, balanced sane and non-melodramatic man I have ever known. With Aaron, everything is plain truth. Plain is one of his favorite words. And truth is the very essence of the man. All of these qualities, the generosity, the wit, the quirkiness, the compassion, and tenderness, and plainness, all of these inhabit his music with a mirror-like truth. Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of these United States, is everlasting in the memory of his country. For on the battleground at Gettysburg, this is what he said. He said that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. But we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people 
by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. It's so wonderful when I trumpet yeah. solo sings out so slow. Can you do it much slower? Sure. And pause between sentences. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And then it all comes out together.
citizens, we cannot escape history. That is what he said. That is what Abraham Lincoln said. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility Kentucky, raised in Indiana, and lived in Illinois. And this is what he said. 
This is what Abe Lincoln said. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our cases do, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Standing erect, he was six feet four inches tall. And this is what he said. He said, it is the eternal struggle between two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world. It is the same spirit that says, you toil and work and earn bread, and I'll eat it, no matter in what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. Lincoln was a quiet man. Abe Lincoln was a quiet and a melancholy man. But when he spoke of democracy, this is what he said. He said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this, to the extent of the difference, is no democracy. Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of these United States, is everlasting in the memory of his country. For on the battleground at Gettysburg, this is what he said. said that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. <laughs> 